Good evening. I have a confession to make. I am intoxicated by words. Language is my gin, my vodka, my Pinot Noir. I use these words to begin my speech at the closing session of a global innovation forum in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, two weeks ago. Needless to say, they were followed by a stunned silence. The laughter only came after I apologized. It's important to know your audience and the local culture. I also use these words to begin my personal statement for American universities. In the US, such statements are intensely, well, personal, as opposed to academic. In both situations, I was taking a risk, and it worked. I was accepted by Columbia, my dream school. I was not arrested in Riyadh, quite the contrary. Uh, an audience member approached me after, after the talk and told me that when he came to London, we could have a vodka together. I told him that gin was my drink of choice. To be empowered is to be bold. Dare to make an impression on other people. Dare to be memorable. More generally, as words can be defined, people can be defined. You must have the audacity to define yourself. I define and empower myself through language. Words are my primary medium, both written and spoken. For as long as I can remember, I've been obsessed with their nuances and dichotomies. They are so malleable and yet so inflexible, so precise and yet so inexact. And that is where their potency lies. Because of their inconsistency, words have the power to transform the possible into the impossible and vice versa. Lies become truths, truths become lies. With words, one can inspire or corrupt, incite or stupefy. Words truly are, as Rudyard Kipling once said, the most powerful drug used by mankind. That, by the way, is from the personal statement that I wrote nine years ago. The words still ring true today. So how can one be memorable? How can one be empowered through language? Empowerment equals connection. And connecting and resonating with your audience essentially boils down to two things. The first is clarity of voice as well as of concept. Words are physical objects. They have a shape and a sound and a feel. Every syllable has a unique texture. The way in which words are strung together in a sentence has a cadence. Pay attention to intonation and emphasis. To the pauses in between, give your words time to breathe. Pay attention to dynamics, crescendos and diminuendos. Delivering a speech is just like singing a cappella without accompaniment. Relish every semiquaver. Clarity of concept results from distilling your message to the bare essentials. Do not embellish unless you're being ironic. Do not add words for the sake of adding words. Simplify to the greatest possible extent. Every sentence, every word, every syllable has a purpose to support the overarching message. The second ingredient is raw emotion. By definition, this is impossible to fake, as it is inextricably intertwined with sincerity. You have to believe and fully invest yourself in every word that you utter. Be authentic and passionate and vulnerable. 99% of what we say is bullshit. And there is indeed a place for that. But by definition, bullshit prevents connection. People respond to authenticity, passion, and vulnerability. One of the most incandescent things in the world is when you recognize yourself in someone else's words, or when your words reflect the thoughts of your audience. Connection equals empowerment for both the speaker and the listener. 
It's the definition of a win-win situation. Emotion and clarity help explain the political victories of 2016, why Trump won, why Vote Leave won. The underlying parallel between these victories is not social or political, but rather how they combined language and empowerment. Both campaigns empowered individuals through language. Let's take back control. It's time to make America great again. Both campaigns are classic case studies of resonance and rhetoric. Let me now take a bit of time to reflect on Brexit, as that is what Sung Hee initially asked me to do. I've been studying the EU referendum through the lens of social media, to be more specific, through Twitter hashtags. Hashtags represent the intersection of language and empowerment. They define our political and social rhetoric. They mobilize people, both online and offline. They've become synonymous with campaigns. Because anyone can create a hashtag and no one has control, hashtags allow ordinary citizens to shape local and global conversations. It is no coincidence that both Trump and Vote Leave campaigners dominated social media through resonant hashtags. For the first time, mainstream media was not in control of what could be said. It lost its gatekeeping potential. What frustrates me the most about Brexit is not the result, but rather the categorization, the labeling of members of the opposition, and the underlying assumptions that these labels signify. Assumptions perpetuated and escalated by silos of thought and echo chambers. According to the media and my academic colleagues, it was the liberal international cosmopolitan elite versus the local, nationalistic, less educated working class. The young versus the old, London and the Southeast versus the rest of the country. Just last week, I was at an academic talk on Brexit in which these classifications emerged. Post-colonial conceptions of the other were invoked. This captured the complete lack of understanding that we have about people who voted leave the complete lack of connection. And yet I do know people who voted Leave and who voted for Trump. They do not fall into the categories presented by academics and the media. In fact, they're just as liberal, intellectual, young, and cosmopolitan as the people I know who voted Remain. Yet because of labels and assumptions, they dare not voice their beliefs to their friends and family. They are disempowered. All my life, I have resisted categorization. I am caught between the US and the UK, academia and industry, fact and fiction, life and art. And I would not have it any other way. I like confusing people with my transatlantic accent. My only constant is travel. I detest the question, where are you from? As it implies only one answer. I answer with cities, not countries. New York and Oxford are my homes, and I hope to add London someday. Don't let people categorize you. Violate their assumptions about who you are and what you believe. Talk to strangers, especially those who challenge you. Expand your perception of what is possible. Define yourself, but have the courage to redefine yourself. Acquire multiple identities. I used to study English literature, uh, everything from Anglo-Saxon to, to Byron to modern British drama. I am now an internet scientist, and in particular, a hashtag expert. I spent this past summer at the Alan Turing Institute doing data science, and I still have no idea what that means. Having mastered words, I am now attempting to master numbers. Above all, remember that clarity and emotion equal connection and empowerment. And finally, put your faith in circumstance and let spontaneity with a generous dash of whimsy be your guide. Trust me, they will not disappoint. In fact, they are the reason I am here today. Thank you.